Jack Parsons, Rockets, Dark Magic, and the Suicide Squad. Join us as we explore the life of one of the most mysterious figures who helped redefine travel technology as we know it. From his interest in the occult to helping achieve space exploration, this is the story of Jack Parsons, the real-life Iron Man. On June 17, 1952, in a quiet Pasadena neighborhood, a violent explosion was heard all over the region. It was at the home of none other than mad scientist Jack Parsons. This brilliant rocket scientist, who once propelled the boundaries of aerospace, met his end in an explosion whose origins remain shrouded in mystery. Was it a mere lab accident or something more sinister tied to his esoteric practices? Was it a plot to silence him? While many believe it was a mishap with volatile chemicals, others speculate darker forces at play, given Parsons' deep involvement in the occult. This incident not only ended the life of a pioneering figure, but also left us with the lingering questions about the convergence of science, magic, and fate. As cops arrived at the scene, they found Parsons partially mutilated and heavily damaged by the debris from his former home. According to one officer, his last words were, but I'm not finished yet. Beyond his strange practices that eventually led to his decline, he was a real-life Tony Stark slash Iron Man character. Always pushing the boundaries of science, spent more time experimenting than many of his peers, and of course, a real-life playboy. Parsons' groundbreaking work at Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory laid the foundation for the U.S. space program. His contributions to rocket engineering earned him acclaim and placed him in the records of scientific history. This is The Dark History Project. Please like and subscribe to know when new episodes are available. Now, let's get started. Jack Parsons had an interesting childhood unlike any other. The way he grew up led him to be one of the most groundbreaking scientists and creators when it came to rocket science. Jack Parsons, born Marvel Whiteside Parsons on October 2, 1914 in Los Angeles, California, led an early life marked by contrasts and hints of the duality that would define his later years. Born into a wealthy family from his mother's side, Jack faced a turbulent childhood when his parents divorced. His father's departure left a deep imprint on the young Parsons, who would later recall feeling a profound sense of abandonment. Living with his mother in Pasadena, Jack developed an early interest in reading and had a particular affinity for science fiction and fantasy. Genres that merged empirical possibilities with the world of the fantastic. He was a huge fan of Jules Verne and didn't see his books just as science fiction. Living with his grandfather, who was of immense wealth, in Pasadena's Orange Grove Boulevard, also known as Millionaire's Lane. It was a street full of mansions and wealthy families. His grandfather supported Parsons' interests in experimenting with chemicals, gunpowder, and rockets. Now, as a reference, back in the 1920s and 30s, rockets were not viewed as a science until after World War II. They were really seen more as the work of science fiction writers. But Parsons had a vision for what they were going to become. However, it was his youthful experiments with gunpowder that would foretell his career in rocketry. By his teenage years, he had already begun experimenting with rockets, largely influenced by the burgeoning field of space exploration and the imaginative possibilities of reaching the stars. His passion for rockets was not purely academic, it was visceral. Together with his friend Ed Foreman, who initially became friends with him after defending him from bullies at school and also had an interest in science fiction, Parsons would spend countless hours conducting experiments which often led to explosive results, much to the chagrin of neighbors and school officials. Parsons grew up with servants and a chauffeur who would drop and pick him up from school. After the Great Depression, his grandfather passed away and the family lost everything. As mentioned before, 
even though not everyone saw a future in rocketry as Parsons did, someone else on the other side of the world saw it as well. None other than Werner von Braun. Parsons heard about his research in rocketry and would call him on the phone, spending hours talking to him and asking about his research and progress on rocket technology. This was in the 1930s, before the German Nazi party reached the height of its power in the early 40s. For those who don't know who Werner von Braun is, he was an aerospace scientist who many say was behind the reason why we went to the moon. But in his prior life, he was a member of the Nazi party and an SS member. He was brought to the United States via Operation Paperclip, where many high-ranking members of the Nazi party were brought to the United States in secrecy because of their technical abilities in military technology. The Suicide Squad Parsons joined Pasadena Junior College after high school, trying to get an associate's degree in chemistry and physics due to his financial situation. In 1934, he united with school friend Edward Foreman and graduate Frank Molina to form the Caltech-affiliated Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, Galkit, Rocket Research Group, with the support of Galkit Chairman Theodor von Karman. The Galkit Rocket Research Group was one of the first rocketry research groups in the United States. They conducted experiments with liquid-fueled rockets, and they made significant contributions to the development of rocketry. The trio was united in their dream of space exploration and the belief that rockets could one day be used to reach outer space. Their early experiments in rocket propulsion were both dangerous and pioneering, which earned them a somewhat notorious reputation. It was due to the perilous nature of their work that they became informally known as the Suicide Squad. Initially operating in the Arroyo Seco Canyon near Pasadena, their experiments often resulted in loud explosions, drawing the attention and concern of locals and the Caltech community. But their determination was unwavering. Despite facing skepticism from the academic establishment and challenges in securing funding, the group persisted in their rocket experiments. Their endeavors caught the attention of Theodor von Karman, director of the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory at Caltech. Under his guidance and with his support, Parsons, Molina, and their expanding team began to work on more sophisticated rocket designs, focusing on jet propulsion and the possibilities for liquid fuels. The Suicide Squad was instrumental in the foundation of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, which today stands as a testament to their vision and tenacity. Despite the ominous name, the Suicide Squad was so-called because of their hazardous experiments with rocket fuels and motors. The Suicide Squad gained popularity throughout the school since this group of students was known for blowing stuff up around the campus. Eventually, they were pushed out to test their research in Arroyo Seco, not far from campus. Strangely, they performed their first test on Halloween night in 1936 near Devil's Gate Dam. These experiments were both groundbreaking and notoriously dangerous. Their work laid much of the foundational knowledge for the U.S. space program, leading to the creation of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, an integral center for space exploration to this day. Their endeavors played a pivotal role in making space exploration a reality, shifting rockets from the realm of science fiction and speculation into tangible, working technology that would eventually take humanity beyond Earth's atmosphere. Parallel to his scientific pursuits, Parsons' personal life was also evolving. His interests began to delve deep into the occult, influenced by figures like Aleister Crowley, this duality, a scientific pioneer by day and an occultist by night, made Parsons one of the most enigmatic figures of the 20th century. He was known as an odd character who would perform rituals, chants, and weird practices before testing rockets and other equipment, raising curiosity from fellow scientists and engineers. Rocketry and the Founding of JPL while still in his 20s, Parsons' efforts, along with those of his colleagues in the Suicide Squad in the early days of rocketry, were frequently met with skepticism from the academic and scientific communities. 
It was Parsons' innovation in the realm of solid rocket propellants that marked a turning point. He co-invented, along with his colleague Theodor von Karman, a castable, composite rocket propellant, a breakthrough that would become foundational for future rocket designs. This formulation greatly improved the stability, safety, and efficiency of rockets. These experimental undertakings led to the foundation of the Aerojet Engineering Corporation and eventually contributed to the establishment of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which became a nexus for American rocketry research and later playing a vital role in NASA's space missions. As the United States became aware of the Germans developing the V-2 rocket, the U.S. military heavily funded the Aerojet Engineering Corporation, which allowed the group to expand and changed its name to Jet Propulsion Laboratory. As the company evolved, they distanced themselves from Parsons and eventually separated themselves entirely. He still wanted to conduct research and experiments like he did in his backyard when he was a kid or with the Suicide Squad. Although Parsons was not directly involved with JPL for a long time due to personal and professional reasons, his early work indisputably paved the way for its creation. Believe it or not, the reason why the term jet or aerojet came into use was because there was an association of the word rocket with science fiction. It was actually Frank Molina, one of the original members of the Suicide Squad, who approached the National Academy of Sciences Committee to request funding for research into what they referred to as jet propulsion, just to stay away from the word rocket and its stigma. But as JPL and the American Space Program were finding their footing, Parsons' own star began to wane. His personal life, characterized by occult practices and association with figures like Aleister Crowley, often overshadowed his professional achievements. Nevertheless, his innovations at a crucial juncture in the history of rocket science undoubtedly helped to ignite the engines of the early American space program. Many professionals who started to move from other industries over to the rocketry space distanced themselves from Parsons due to the many rumors. After establishing the Aerojet Engineering Corporation, he came into wealth once again. In 1939, Parsons was introduced to the Ordo Templis Orientis, or OTO, in Hollywood through a friend, and he got deeply involved with its founder, Aleister Crowley, who he was in constant contact with until the founder's death. After buying a lease of the infamous house in Orangeville Grove, Pasadena, this mansion acquired by Parsons became a legend of its own, the house known as the Parsonage is where Parsons would run a lodge for the OTO and where many of the problems that led to his downfall originated. He would rent rooms to the other members of the lodge and charge them rent. Many of the people who lived there were anything from artists, musicians, engineers, and fellow scientists. The house was full of strange practices, such as open relationships, late night rituals, heavy use of alcohol and drugs, as well as strange parties. As people came in and out of the house, some of the people who lived there included journalist Neeson Himmel, who was famous for covering the Black Dahlia murder, and Manhattan Project physicist Robert Kornog, who made significant discoveries regarding hydrogen and helium isotopes. One of the other famous guests that you probably know about is none other than L. Ron Hubbard. Parsons and Hubbard became really good friends and eventually invested in several businesses. Hubbard's interest in magic brought them closer together until Hubbard moved to Florida to start a business with all of Parsons' life savings and the love of his life, Betty. As the Parsonage had rules of fully open relationships and Parsons was supposed to respect them, Parsons became deeply jealous, something that he was not supposed to be. Sarah Betty Northrop was actually the sister of Jack Parsons' first wife, who he left her for. Betty left Jack and moved to Florida with Hubbard and eventually married him. Obviously, the friendship dissolved after that, and in later years, when the involvement of Hubbard and the OTO came into question, the Church of Scientology released a press statement saying that Hubbard was actually working undercover for the Navy, and his goal was to destroy the cult and save Betty. Of course, none of that was substantiated. Soon after, Parsons sold the house and resigned from the OTO. 
1946, he remarried and moved to Manhattan Beach. As he was still seen as an expert in rocketry, he had several jobs including one in the Navajo Missile Program and acted as a consultant. As the Cold War emerged, several of these former OTO members were stripped of their clearances and questioned about their loyalty, and eventually, so was he. He was told about his involvement with the OTO and perverse practices. Parsons was not able to find work in the industry he helped develop, and eventually, he worked as a gas station laborer and a car mechanic and eventually returned to the occult. Parsons eventually found Hughes Aircraft. As he was employed there, an old friend put him in contact with the president of the Southern California chapter of the American Technion Society, a group dedicated to supporting the newly created State of Israel. He was offered a job with the Israeli rocket program, but soon was fired from Hughes Aircraft after he tried to copy technical documents and was reported to the FBI. Ultimately, he was not charged with espionage. Soon after, he moved back to Pasadena's Orange Grove Boulevard and converted part of his home into a laboratory. Parsons planned to take a job building an explosives factory for the Mexican government. A day before he planned on leaving June 17, 1952, he was working on a rushed order from a film set to develop some explosives. As he was working on this order, there was a huge blast, so severe that it not only destroyed a portion of his residence, but also caused fatal injuries to Parsons. He was found alive, but severely injured, and he succumbed to his injuries a few hours later. His right arm was partially amputated, both his legs suffered fractures, and police said that he had a hole in his face. According to one officer who first arrived at the scene and found Parsons, his last words were, but I'm not finished yet. The reasons behind the explosion are still a matter of debate. The official explanation is that he was handling fulminate of mercury, a highly sensitive explosive compound which detonated, leading to the accident. However, considering Parsons' experience and familiarity with volatile substances, some found it hard to believe that he could make such a fatal mistake. It is also important to note that despite all his experience, he still acted as a kid, playing with toys. The mixture of chemicals was done in a coffee can, which was believed he dropped causing the initial blast and eventually coming into contact with other chemicals in the room that caused bigger blasts. All of this being said, let's keep in mind that he was actually partially distanced from JPL and some of his other jobs because of his lack of safety when experimenting with chemicals. It was also found that the way he stored chemicals was almost criminal, not to mention they found narcotics paraphernalia in the room. This was enough for the police to close the investigation. Afterward, plenty of theories came to light about his death, from Howard Hughes ordering his death because of the alleged stolen documents from his company, to being done by a group of cops due to his testimony in the arrest of a fellow police officer, to anti-Zionist groups because of the work he was going to do with the Israeli rocket program. In the mesmerizing tapestry of the 20th century, Jack Parsons stands out as a testament to the coexistence of genius and eccentricity. While his pioneering contributions to rocket science helped launch humanity toward the stars, his enigmatic beliefs and dalliances with the occult remind us of the multifaceted nature of genius. Parsons' groundbreaking strides in the development and testing of solid rocket propellants paved the way for the subsequent development of solid-fueled rockets, which have been crucial in various space and military applications to this day. His life, a confluence of groundbreaking innovations and esoteric pursuits, serves as a compelling narrative about the thin line between brilliance and madness. As we close this chapter, we're reminded that sometimes the most profound advancements come from those who dare to think differently and challenge the status quo. Thank you for being with us for this episode of The Dark History Project. Hopefully, we inspired some of you to look further into these characters and stories. 
please help us out by sharing, subscribing, or liking this episode. If the platform you are listening to allows for comments, please let us know what you think. Feel free to discuss this topic or what topics you would like for us to cover in the future. We hope you enjoyed it. Our next episode will come out soon where we'll talk about Galileo, the rebel astronomer who redefined our universe. See you then.